So I wanna talk to you today about dealing with disappointment. Dealing with disappointment. Could it be that your disappointment is actually a platform, a setup for where God is about to take you? Sometimes we go through things that don't make sense. We feel like we're being pulled back, but what God says is I'm about to launch you further, faster, but you've got to, you've got to learn how to handle disappointment. I can't handle what happens to me, but I can handle what happens in me. I can't control what comes against me. Life sometimes is messy, it's unfair. I can't control what you say to me, what you do to me, but I can control what I say to me. And I can control what I say to you. And I can control how I respond to you regardless of how you treat me. When we look in the Bible, there's so many characters. I was trying to find a character to deal with disappointment. And the hard thing was, Every character in the Bible had disappointment. I mean, you look at uh, Adam, you look at uh, 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 Joshua, you look at Moses and Joseph and Jacob and Isaac and Esther and Gideon and David. I mean, there's not a character in the Bible that didn't deal with disappointment. Moments where things didn't go their way. And I wanna look at a scripture on how we deal with disappointment. What do we do with it? Because disappointment is inevitable, but misery is optional. Right, I know I'm gonna face disappointment. It's not a sin to have a disappointment, but it is a sin when I let it steal my joy, when I let it steal my peace, when I let it stop me from moving forward in life. In Jeremiah 2, verse 13, the prophet was inspired by God. Yeah, you can shout for joy. Jeremiah said this. God was speaking through him. He said, my people have committed a compound sin. My people have treated their disappointment, their discontentment in a way that I would never want them to handle it. He says they've left the place where they can actually find satisfaction. They've walked out on me, the fountain of living water, the source that can heal their disappointment, the source that can solve their frustrations and their relational pains. They've walked out on the source of living waters and they've dug cisterns. A cistern is a well where we would try to find satisfaction. In the, in the old days, they would dig a well for survival. So we see wells popping up all through the book of Genesis, all the way to into the New Testament. Wells were survival. It was things that people would do and dig deep to try and satisfy and try and fix, the, 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 the try and give them more life, more hope. A well meant I could live a little bit longer because I've got some water to draw from. And what Jeremiah says is they've dug broken wells in hopes that they're going to satisfy their disappointment and hopes to numb the pain in their life. And the problem is these cisterns can't hold any water at all. So now let's go to Genesis 33 because there's this well that was started in Genesis 33 verse 18. And it was a guy named Jacob who had walked through so much relational uh, uh, conflict with his parents, with his wife, with his kids, with his second wife, with everyone in his life. Jacob had issues. And he comes to Genesis 33, verse 18, and he buys this piece of land, and it's in a town called Sheshem. In the city of Sheshem, Jacob sets up camp there, and sometimes we go places that God never called us to go. In most of the the moments in Jacob's life, he heard the voice of God calling him to certain places, or his family would send him to certain places. But in this moment in his life, Jacob goes on his own way. I would say that oftentimes our disappointment is when we go our own way, when we have expectations that God never gave us, that people gave us, that, that our own selfish ambitions stirred up in us, and when we don't see those expectations met, we're left with disappointment. So Jacob buys this piece of land and he digs this well. And you can actually go to the very same piece of land, the same well that was dug thousands of years ago. It is covered today. It's in the West Bank of Israel. If you were to go on an Israel trip and and, and you felt like venturing into the West Bank, you could go to the Church of St. Fotina. It is a Greek Orthodox church that built their cathedral on top of Jacob's well, on top of this a place that Jacob had bought a piece of land that one day he would give to his son Joseph. But what happened in this place, Jacob would never expect to happen. Jacob could never plan on happening. In fact, in this place in the next chapter, Jacob experienced the worst thing that a father could experience. His daughter is hurt in such a way that a guy does something to her that no dad would ever wish to happen to their daughter. And Jacob is heartbroken at the well. 
when he hears the news about what this guy did to his daughter, he is so hurting on the inside, but he doesn't know what to do. And I don't have time to get into it, but Genesis 34 is a massacre. His sons take revenge out on the guy that hurt his daughter. And there's just a, a mess, a bloodbath, and the whole city is angry at Jacob. And now Jacob and his whole family is at odds with each other. Literally, just a chapter before this, Jacob had one of the greatest moments in his life. Isn't it like life where we have incredible moments, we're on the highest of highs, and then we're in the lowest of lows? Jacob is left here disappointed, disappointed in himself as a dad, disappointed in his sons, disappointed with God, disappointed with what just happened to his family. And so the next chapter, it ends in Genesis 34 with Jacob just weeping for his family, heartbroken, heartache. And we go to Genesis 35, verse one, and watch what God says to Jacob right after this disappointment. While Jacob is weeping at his well, God says, Jacob, go back to Bethel. Stay there and build an altar to the God who revealed himself to you when you were running for your life from your brother Esau. What God is saying here is God saying, go back to the place where I satisfied you the last time when you were disappointed. Go back to the source that helped meet your needs when you were hurting the last time from relational disappointment. See, disappointment is, is real. And probably the, the, the most painful disappointment is relational disappointment. I can handle career disappointment when I don't get a promotion, when things don't maybe turn out the way I wanted in my career, but man, when I am feeling rejected and heartbroken from a family member and, and the relational pain, the best friend, that's hurtful. That's where Jacob's at. And God says, Jacob, get up from the well that you dug, dug here. Get up from the place that you camped out that I never told you to camp out in and go back to Bethel. Now, I gotta be careful saying this in Tulsa because we take everything literally. We're like, I'm supposed to move to Bethel? I need to go to Redding, California. I knew God was speaking to me. I'm going to California, to Bethel Church with Bill Johnson. No, that's not what this message is about. It's not about a location change. It's about a source change. It's, it's asking yourself the question, where do I go when I'm disappointed? Some of us go to our phone. Okay, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, emails, games, Satisfy me. It's empty. All the likes and the comments and, and the followers, it's not enough. Once I reach that amount, it's not enough. It's never enough. And God says, get up from this broken well and go back to the place where I can satisfy your deepest thirst, your deepest hunger. So Jacob tells his family, around the well. He says, guys, it's time for us to leave Sheshem. It's time for us to get up and leave this place, this campsite. We're not staying here. And he says this in verse two. He says, get rid of all your idols. Get rid of all your alien gods. Think, when we go to places that God never called us to go, we end up doing things that God never called us to do. And we end up taking in idols that never satisfy us. So Jacob says, get rid of the idols. Get rid of this. We're not taking that with us. Where we're headed, we can't take uh, where we've been. Where we're going is somewhere new. And we can't squeeze our idols into God's presence. Where God's about to take you, you might have had some heartache. You might have walked through a divorce. You might have lost a family member. But you can't take that idol of regret, of shame, of condemnation into the presence of God. God's saying, I want you to leave it behind. Leave it in Shechem. You don't need to bring that pain into your next marriage. You don't need to take out on your next spouse what your last spouse did to you. Amen. There's certain idols that just aren't worth carrying with you towards Bethel. So Jacob says, I want you to get rid of the idols. I want you to take a bath, wash yourselves, cleanse yourselves, sanctify. There's a sanctification that God, God wants to do in our hearts today. And then he says, put on clean clothes. Today, we're gonna have water baptisms in just a little bit. And what's so amazing about water baptism is it's a washing away of the old man and it's a resurrection of the new man. Watch what happens in the next verse. In Genesis 35, verse, verse four. 
Verse four, it says, they turned over to Jacob all the idols that they had been holding on to, all their lucky charm earrings, and Jacob buried them. Everybody say, bury it. When we, when we do water baptism, there's a burial that happens. The old us, the old ways, the old thirsts that we've been going back to get buried. He buried them under the tree and they set out. Lord, I pray that you'd speak to us in these next few minutes, God, on how to handle disappointment, how to move forward, how to have victory over disappointment, how to move into the new season and the new place that you've called us to walk into, that it's not a location change, it's a source change. And God, I pray, Lord, that today we would get your message. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do right now in our hearts, in our minds. Let us leave changed, refreshed, revived by the source of living water. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter four, Jesus finds himself in this rivalry that people had been trying to stir up. It was in verse one that Jesus realized the religious people of the day were trying to stir up a rivalry between him and John the Baptist. And they were keeping score of who had more baptisms, right? They were saying, Jesus has more than John. Jesus has more followers than John. And be careful when people start comparing you to other people. It, it never leads to anything good. Even, it, it either leads to pride or it leads to envy and discouragement. So Jesus is like, I'm not playing your games. I'm not playing your comparison games. So Jesus leaves. He leaves the comparison trap and he starts walking towards Judea. And on the way towards Judea, he comes through a town called Samaria, which happens to be in the West Bank today in Israel, and actually happens to be on a site today called the Church of St. Fotina. And he comes across this Samaritan village that bordered the field that Jacob had bought 2,000 years before this moment. The same field that Jacob had experienced the worst tragedy that happened in his family with his daughter. And he comes across the well. It says the well was still there. The well that Jacob had dug was still there. Even though God had told Jacob to leave it, the people kept it. And Jesus was exhausted from his journey, so he sits down at Jacob's well, and it was noontime. And noontime was a time where no one would go to the well. The ladies would typically go to the well early in the morning because that was their gossip time, right? They'd come together and they'd gossip about all the women in the town. But this one lady comes at noon, and the reason she doesn't go in the morning is because she's the source of their gossip. And the reason she's the source of their gossip is because she's been through not just one failed marriage, not just one divorce, but two divorces, three divorces, four, five, five weddings that didn't work out, five marriages that didn't go the way that she would have hoped, five disappointments. And now she's living with a guy that's not even her husband. And she comes up and she sees this Jew sitting on Jacob's well. And she's thinking, what are you doing here? Samaritans and Jews, they don't get along. There was a racial divide, a prejudice divide. And Jesus said, would you give me a drink of water? He was all by himself. And the woman says, why are you a Jew asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink of water? And Jesus says, if you knew the generosity of God, if you knew who was talking to you, you would ask me for a drink. And I would give you fresh, living water. She says, hold up, you don't even have a bucket to draw with. This well is deep. Do you know who dug this well? Sir, this is the real well. This is Jacob, our ancestor, who dug this well and he drank from it. This woman doesn't even know her history. She doesn't realize that the well that Jacob dug was also the well that did not satisfy him, that God told him to leave behind, but people kept drinking from the well of disappointment. The same well that she's so excited about, Jesus is like, do you know the history behind this well? Do you know the, the bloodbath that surrounded this well? Do you know the relational pain and disappointment that happened at this well that caused Jacob to leave this well behind? And she says, are you better than our ancestor Jacob? And I, I guess that's the question I'm asking you, is Jesus better than Jacob to you? Is Jesus better than Instagram to you? Is Jesus better than your husband, better than your wife? You say, no, 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 my husband can satisfy all my needs. There's not a person on earth that is constantly reliable enough to make a foundational source of contentment for you. There's not a place 
There's not even a church. It's okay to come to church going, I hope the pastor preaches a message just for me. It's not okay if your happiness is dependent upon it. Because some Sunday, I'm gonna preach a message that's for somebody else besides you. And you're gonna go, he's not meeting my needs. I gotta dig another well, and I gotta hop to another church, and another church, and another church. And I gotta go to another husband, and another husband, and another husband, and another wife, because they're not meeting my needs, and we're still drinking from Jacob's well, and no wonder we're thirsty, because we're drinking from wells that can't reliably satisfy our needs and our thirst on a constant basis. Watch what Jesus says, he says, everyone, look at this, in the, in the next verse, verse 13, he says, everyone who drinks from Jacob's well, everyone who drinks from a person, place, or thing on this earth as if it is the foundational source for happiness is gonna continually be disappointed. The reason you're so angry and disappointed and frustrated with your season of life is because you're staking your happiness on Jacob's well. And you fill in the blank, whatever that is. Once I'm married, I'll be happy. Once we have kids, I'll be happy. Once my kids move out of the house, I'll be happy. Once I get a college scholarship, I'll finally overcome disappointment when God finally does what I want him to do, when my plans go my way. See, Jacob's well is, is expectations that maybe God doesn't even want you to have, that God didn't actually plant there, that some other person did. And when we don't get our way, Jesus says you're gonna be thirstier and thirstier and thirstier. Turn to the person next to you, say, are you thirsty? <laughs> Jesus said this though, he says, anyone who comes to me will never thirst again. In fact, I will give them an artisan spring, gushing fountains of endless life. Come on, Jesus! Jesus plus nothing equals everything I need. Just a little example. I wonder who you've put a well over. <laughs> it's like this. Some of us have put our spouse in a well. Some of us have put our church in a well. Some of us have put our pastor in a well. Some of us have put our company in a well. And we're like, come on. <laughs> and then there's no satisfaction. There's just continual disappointment. It's because we've built a well around a person that can't meet our needs. Jesus says, go ahead. Step out of that, that, that disappointment and come to the fountain of endless supply. So here, here's how we deal with disappointment. Number one, we fill up with the right source. We start filling up with the right source. When things don't go our way, when the electricity goes out, when our marriage isn't going the way we planned, when life doesn't turn out the way you hoped, instead of going back to new wells and new addictions and pornography or drugs or alcohol or another man or another woman or a booty call or whatever it is you wanna go back to, Fill up with the right source. Everybody say, fill up with the right source. When I was a college student at Oral Roberts University, I used to love, yes, O-R-U, in the house. I used to love going to Saga. It was our cafeteria. And I would go over to the chocolate milk fountain. We had a chocolate milk fountain. Who has that? O-R-U does. Go to O-R-U. So I would go to the chocolate milk fountain morning, lunch, so breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and I would fill to overflow. I gained the freshman 15, the freshman 20, the freshman 30, the freshman 40, the freshman 50. I'm still trying to get rid of the freshman something. The chocolate milk was so good. And then we had a fun run, right? And it's not a fun run. It's a run that's not fun. You run, you run for miles. And they test your endurance, and they test how long it takes you to finish the mile, and that's how they know, you know how, how much in shape you are. And I collapsed in the race. I'm like, and they had to take me to the nurse. And the nurse said, have you been drinking enough fluids because you're dehydrated? I said, yeah, I've been drinking tons of fluids. She said, what fluids have you been drinking? I said, chocolate milk, Mountain Dew, chocolate milk, Mountain Dew, chocolate milk. <laughs> She's like, that is Terrible. That makes me want to throw up. I was like, yeah, I just threw up out there in the race. Everybody say, fill up with the right source. She said, water is the only thing that's going to hydrate you. Water, 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 
Water is life. Second Peter 1 verse 3 says that God has given us everything we need. God, his divine power, Christ in us, gives us everything we need. When I am drinking from the right source, I have everything I need to be happy. So I don't come to church empty. They better do what I want. They better sing my songs. I don't go into a relationship or a party looking for people to meet my needs or going to work. They better make me happy today. I can actually go into every environment and go, man, I'm good. How are you good? I guess I've been filling up on the right source. So I'm not cynical about services and I'm not critical about my spouse and I'm not angry and disappointed with my workplace and people aren't treating me fair. I'm all good because in God, I have everything I need, so I'm happy. Let me go, I'm happy. Take the church, I'm happy. I'll be all good. With Christ, I have everything I need. Jesus plus nothing equals everything I need. The second you find that out, you treat everything in life differently. You're no longer insecure depending on wells that are gonna end up disappointing you. Here's the second thing. And that is recognize the choice is yours every day. Recognize the choice is yours. I don't have to feel happy to choose to be happy. I don't have to feel uh, uh, like my needs have been met to choose that I am content. Contentment or disappointment is my choice every day. Did you know that disappointment is a choice? If you ever grew up in a home where your parents said, I'm disappointed in you, it was their choice to be disappointed in you. It was because they didn't, you didn't do something they wanted you to do. It's our choice to stay disappointed. It's also our choice to, to be content, to say, you know what, I'm good. I'm all right, even though I didn't get what I want. Paul said it like this in Philippians 4, verse 11, while he was hanging in sewage, he's in a prison writing the book of Philippians. It's not out on the beach. It's not in Destin, Florida. It's not sunny. Springtime's not happening. He's in a dark dungeon, and the sewage of the city is running over his head, and he says, I've learned to be content, whatever circumstances I'm in, single or married, having kids or not having kids, while everybody else is experiencing awesomeness on Instagram, I'm not looking to the left or to the right. I've learned the secret that the choice every day is I get to choose in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in abundance or living in want, that Christ in me gives me the power to choose every day. You can have Christ living in your heart but still deny yourself the choice to be happy. That's God, he's giving you the choice. He doesn't force contentment on you. He gives you the choice every day to look at your family and go, man, I wish things were different. And to scroll through our phone, searching for contentment, searching for satisfaction, or to just open your eyes and go, it's a great day to be alive. It's a great day to go to church. It's a great day to look at my kids and go, wow, I'm blessed. It's a great day to look at whatever it is that God's given me. Whatever hand I've been dealt, I'm choosing to be happy. Abe Lincoln said it like this, most people are as happy as they've decided to be. There was an elderly man in his early 90s who was being taken to a nursing home. His wife had died and he was all by himself in his house. He didn't have any family members that came to pick him up and take him to a nursing home. True story. So he calls a taxi, the taxi comes, this elderly man is carrying his two suitcases slowly down the steps towards the taxi cab. Taxi guy doesn't even get out to help him. The older man sticks it in the car. The taxi takes him to the nursing home. He gets to the nursing home, goes inside. The woman at the front says, I'll be showing you to your room. He says, oh, I'm so excited. I can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait. It's gonna be awesome. She said, you haven't even seen the room yet. He said, I don't have to see the room to choose to be excited. I don't have to see the room to choose to be happy. I've decided that no matter what room I'm in, no matter where I'm at, I'm gonna be happy. This last week, we honored and celebrated a man of our faith who stepped into eternity, Billy Graham, who lived a life. Yeah, give him a big hand. Let's honor <laughs> Billy Graham today. I love this quote from Billy Graham. He said this, and we'll put it on the screen. He said, the Christian life is not a constant high. I have my moments of deep discouragement. We would be lying if we said we're never disappointed in life. But he said, what I do with that, that's up to me. 
And so I go to God in prayer with tears in my eyes. And I say, God, forgive me. Or God, help me. I, I remember watching this interview with Billy Graham and just thinking, wow. Even the greatest men of faith walk through disappointment. But it's our choice how long we hang on to that disappointment. It's when we go to God in prayer and say, God, help me to move forward. There's a woman in our church that does this so well. And I, I went to her house, I surprised her this last week, and she didn't know I was coming, and, and well, we gave her a heads up right before I went there. We did give her a heads up. But it was amazing because she reminds me of this one time I was jogging on a trail, and I came across this gravel path, and there was this brown field of thorns and thistles and, and all kinds of brown stuff, no green stuff, no trees, no you know, fruit, no, 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 no plants that were green. But in the middle of this thorny thistle field was this beautiful sunflower that somehow had bloomed in the middle of thorns and thistles. And this woman in our church reminds me of that sunflower that in the midst of disappointment and circumstances, she's made the decision to be happy. I want you to check out this testimony from Rose Bolin. Hey, I'm here with Roseanne Bolin, a member of Victory. She's been going to our church since the very beginning. I know this testimony is going to bless you. So let's go inside and meet Roseanne Bolin. Oh, hey! hey! How are you? Welcome to the House Come of on. Victory! Yes. Well, hey, we're here with Roseanne, a member of Victory Church for how many years now? Since the beginning. Since the beginning, 1981. Yes, yes I was on crutches and I had a speech impediment and I shook so bad I couldn't hold a glass of water without spilling it. Wow. But I knew in my heart, God said that if I got around the Word of God, I would be healed. And my first job here was working for Oral Roberts Ministries. And my family laughed and they're like, he's not gonna hire you, you have a disability. And I'm like, yes, he will. And I walked around the campus for eight and a half hours. When I um, got home, I told my friend that I got a job, and she's like, what? You got a job? I've been here for nine months, and you got a job? So I asked my boss, I said, why did you hire me? Because I had no experience, nothing. And uh, she said, because of your determination and your smile. Your okay. determination and your smile. Mm -hmm. Someone out there needs to hear this. Yep. And so after I got laid off at Old Roberts, I was staying with a lady temporarily. Um, and when she found out back then that I was thinking about applying for a disability, she kicked me out of her house. Mm. I lived under a bridge for five and a half days. Wow. And I'm like, Lord, you'll take care of me wherever I am. Lord, you'll help me find money so that I can put it in the offering. Because every time the offering bucket goes by, I don't care if I have a nickel in my purse or if I have my tithe in my purse, but something's going in there. You got out from living under the bridge. And I moved into government housing. And then from government housing, I moved into this house. Come on. And when did you pay this house off? I paid this house off uh, October of 2017. You are debt free in this house. Yes. Come on, Jesus. That's the power of the seed though. You won Miss Wheelchair of Oklahoma this yes. year. 2017. 2017. I just finished my ring. Come on. And we yes. took a picture with you with your crown on. Yes. Amazing, Roseanne. Share just a little bit of your journey of learning in every job, in every season, how to trust in God, how to be happy no matter what was going on around you. Um, talk a little bit about you know keeping your smile, keeping your joy, because I think there's people out there that need to hear your testimony on that. Well, sometimes it's really hard to keep your joy, but I knew that that was the key for me. And, I, and sometimes if I had trouble keeping my joy, I would try to make other people laugh so wow. that my my joy would return. That's amazing, Roseanne. So, How did you, there was a season you worked at the Marriott. I worked at the Hilton. The Hilton, yes. you worked at the Hilton. And talk about how you won the, the award to, out of all the employees. 
Um, out of 80,000 nominees, I was one of the 42 that got chosen worldwide to win this Spirit of Pride Award. And it was for people that um, worked for the Hilton Corporation, but also did volunteer work. I told the Lord that I would serve him no matter what, whether I was laying down, sitting in a wheelchair, standing up on my crutches, or jumping for joy. Come on. I am going to serve him when my husband was sick. It was really tough. Like, Lord, do I uh, buy groceries or do I buy his medicine? I mean, mm. it really got that rough. And um, during that time, that's when I wanted to drive. And I was like, Lord, I, I need to drive. I need to get them to the doctor. And so I started picking up pennies off the ground. I picked up over $5,000 in a year. And I told the Lord I would rather touch people's hearts than touch my car. And so I remember handing the money to your father. Oh my goodness. And he's like, Where'd this come from? And I said, well, you can call it a labor of love because I picked it up off the ground. And so he wanted me to give my testimony back then. So I gave my testimony back then. And that evening, I had a car. Whoa. God is faithful. Yes, he is. Wow. Yes. And so... It doesn't matter whether you give your time or if you give your tithe. I mean, I give money every time the bucket goes by because I don't want to miss an opportunity. Wow. I mean, I want my seed in the ground. Yeah. I want to have the most beautiful flower garden. I mean, you know, all my seeds are going to be popping up. I just want to say that Jesus is for everyone. He doesn't care what background you came from. Yeah what religion you came from. He wants your heart, and He wants you to love Him like He loves you because He gave it all for you. Yes. He gave His life, and, and it's worth trusting God for because I'm a living testimony of trusting the Lord and knowing that He can deliver me no matter what I go through. Come on, how powerful is that? Rose, are you here? Where are you, Rose? Wave your hand. There she is right there, Rose, Roseanne Bolin, sitting right here in the back part of this section. What a powerful testimony. Wow. You are a Rose. You are a true Rose. Wow. Church, we have no excuses to complain, to be cynical, to be bitter. When you see the testimony of Rose and you see the smile and the choice every day, I choose to rejoice. I choose to be content. My circumstances don't dictate my happiness. My disappointment is not going to last long. I'm gonna shake it off. Disappointment is inevitable, but how long you hold on to it, that's up to you. The thing I love about Rose is my next point right here. She turned her need into a seed. She turned her need into a seed. I want you to just say that with me. Turn my need into a seed. She said, I wasn't feeling joyful, so I decided to make others laugh. I wasn't feeling encouraged, so I decided to be an encourager at my workplace. What if instead of waiting for people to like your post and to leave an affirming comment, you just started going out and affirming everybody? You started encouraging. What if you just got liberal with your encouragement? You just started giving it away. Hey, you're doing a great job. I believe in you. God's got a plan for you. You look beautiful today. You're a mighty man of God. I'm so proud of you. What if you started giving what it is that you need? If you have a need, turn it into a seed. And then Rose, she said, I needed a car. 
But instead of demanding God to give me a car, I started sowing my seed. And what did God do? He blessed her with a car. I needed to pay off my house. But what did she do? She started sowing. Now she's debt free in her house. You know, Rose rides our bus every single Sunday. We have a bus that picks people up in wheelchairs all over the city. That's your generosity that's reaching people like Rose. That's Rose's generosity that's reaching people like her all over our city. I wanna give you a chance right now to sow your seed. At the end of your row, there are envelopes, seed envelopes. I dare you today to do what Rose did. If you have a need, sow a seed. If you're walking through a disappointment, sow a seed. If you're going through a season of discouragement, sow a seed. If you're waiting on a breakthrough, sow a seed. If you're believing to get out of debt, sow a seed. If there's any kind of need in your life, I dare you to turn your need, flip the need into a seed and watch what God will do. Watch what God does. When we stop living as needy, constant demanding Christians asking God to do everything for us and we start going you know what you've blessed me so much God I'm gonna help some other people I'm gonna help some other people I'm gonna encourage some other people I'm gonna give what is what is a seed it's giving something of your time your money your life you say well Paul it's my money but once we realize it's not just our money that everything belongs to the Lord it helps us to kind of trust him a little bit more with our tithe with an offering to say, you know what, I'm gonna sow. What does our seed go towards? Well, things like the bus that picks people up, the gas that picks people up every Sunday. It goes towards things like the Dream Center. We have a literacy program where we're helping second and third grade kids to read and write in North Tulsa. They are passing their tests. We hired teachers that are teaching in our after school program. We're seeing incredible results. Our generosity is changing our community. Our generosity is helping people inside the church and outside the church. When we sow seed into victory, man, it compounds. It just flows out local and global with God's salvation, God's love. It goes towards atheists that are getting saved every week, kids that are getting impacted by God's love in children's church. Turn your need into a seed and watch what God will do. Pastor CJ, will you come up here and pray over our offering this morning? I'm so thankful for CJ Jacobs. We're gonna sow this morning, and, and then I'm gonna close the message out with an opportunity for water baptism. But CJ, will you just pray over everyone who's sowing it? Write your prayer request on your seed. Write, it, write the need that you have on there. We lift them up every week. Amen. Father, we thank you that you showed us the power of the seed as you sent your son Jesus as a seed to the world. You sowed your son into planet Earth and now you have sons and daughters yes. that are, you're, you're reaping a harvest of the seed that you sowed. Lord, let us practice that principle today. I pray for every family member that is sowing a seed right now in that seed envelope as they plant it. They got mortgages they won't pay it off. Yes. Car payments they won't pay. Yes. College tuition is jacking them up, Lord God. Father, some of them have utility bills that they can't yes. pay right now. They owe people money right now, Lord God. Let them see Jesus interceding on your right hand right now just for them yes. as they plant that seed he said father that's one of mine that's one of mine and let them receive the harvest in the name of jesus i pray father hallelujah amen 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 amen, amen. what we're going to do is we're going to worship right now while we give and the ushers will step out to receive the offering but if it's easier for you to give on text you could do that or online and, and the last point of this message on how we deal with disappointment is we turn our needs into seeds, but we worship our way out of disappointment. We worship our way from a place of disappointment to a place of thankfulness, from complaining to gratitude. So we're just gonna worship right now for a moment, and then I'm gonna invite those that wanna get baptized in just a moment. But let's just take this time as we're giving. No one leave. I promise it'll be worth your time. Let's hang out for a little bit longer as we worship God while we give. Jesus have your way, Jesus have your way in me, I'm taking up my cross, Jesus have your way in me, Jesus have your way, Jesus have your way in me, no matter what the cost, Jesus have your way.
across this room, if you would just stand to your feet. Maybe you're here right now and you say, Paul, there's some things that I need to repent of. There's some sins, there's some wells that I've been drinking from that I know aren't good for me. Maybe it is unforgiveness, maybe it is an addiction, a habit that you've been trying to break. And, and I wanna challenge us as we finish this series today that we would not take certain things into March with us. That we would be able to walk into the month of March with some things that we need to leave behind, some attitudes, some offenses, some, some, some toxic habits, some toxic things we've been holding on to. And all over this place, maybe you're here right now and you say, Paul, I've asked Jesus in my heart, but I wanna get water baptized. I want, I wanna go public with my faith. I want that water that just washes me where the old goes down and the new comes up. Maybe you came today ready to get water baptized. Maybe you came not ready, but we've got everything you need. We've got shirts, we got shorts, we got the towel, we got the tank over there. Today is your day, no excuses. Everybody say no excuses. What is water baptism? It's going public with the decision you've made to follow Jesus. It's something that even Jesus did. If you're ready to do that right now, I want you to just slip your hand up all over this room. Eyes open, heads up, come on, today is your day. You're saying, I wanna do it, I wanna do it. I'm ready to get water baptized. Today I maybe didn't come ready, but since you got the, the shirts, the shorts, if you raised your hand or should have raised your hand, would you just leave right now if you're ready to get baptized? Come to my left. Leave right out this door right here. We're gonna get you baptized right here, right now. Come on down. My left, your right, right over by this exit door. Come on, cheer on every man, every woman, every married couple, every husband, every wife, every grandmother, grandfather, grandson, granddaughter. Entire families are getting baptized today. This is your moment. Praise God, praise God. Here's what I want us to do. As they're getting ready to get baptized, I want us just to worship right now. The last point of this message is worship your way out of disappointment. If you've been finding yourself in a season of disappointment, if you're not where you wanna be, if things haven't turned out the way that you thought they would, if maybe expectations of, of this season haven't been met, I dare you right now to shift from an attitude of grumbling and complaining to an attitude of worship. God told Jacob, Jacob, go to Bethel and build an altar and worship me. Worship me. When you've walked through disappointment, the last step is just to turn to worship. When you can't explain it, you just turn to worship. You just surrender it to God. When the woman met Jesus at the well, it says she left her jar at Jacob's well and she went back to her city and she said, I think I found the Messiah. I think I found the one who can satisfy all our thirst, all our needs, all our desires, and the whole town came and worshiped Jesus. I want us just to take a time right now to release whatever disappointments we came in here with today, whatever expectations haven't been met, whatever things we're walking through, to bring it into the presence of God. This is Bethel. This is the place where God wants to meet you. This is the place where God's inviting you to worship. I wanna invite you right now down to this altar. If that's you, if this message was speaking to you, I want you to just leave your seat. Come and find a place at this altar. Worship your way out of discouragement. Worship your way out of disappointment. Worship your way out of the shame, out of the guilt, out of the condemnation, out of whatever things haven't worked out. Doesn't matter what anyone else thinks, this is your time. Secondly, right now, I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. If you're here right now and you say, Paul, I need forgiveness. I need God's grace right now. I need to fill up on God's love. There's been things that you've been walking through, pain you've been walking through. I want you to just raise your hand today. You're saying, I need to get things right with God. I need to surrender. I need to let his love wash over me. I need his forgiveness. I need to repent of some things. If you raised your hand or should have raised your hand, come and join us at this altar. Worship team, would you just begin to lead us in worship? And why don't you find a place at this altar? If that's you, if God's speaking to you, young woman, if God's speaking to you, married man, married woman, if God's speaking to you, walking through a divorce, whatever it is that you faced, bring it to the altar. Bring it to the altar. Bring it to Bethel. Bring it to the place of worship. Just release it to God. Say, God, I'm giving it to you. God, I'm turning my complaining into worship. Lord, I'm turning my grumbling into thanksgiving. Go ahead, lead us in worship. I am a
God's doing something right now. Holy Spirit, have your way. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. I lay it all down again to hear you say that I'm your friend. You are my desire. No one else will do. Cause nothing else could take the place, Jesus, to feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find a way, bring me back to you. And you're all I want. You're all I ever needed. You're all I want. Lord, I know you are here. Lord, I know you are here. One more time. You're all I want, God. You're all I want, Jesus. You're all I ever need. You're all I want. Lord, I know you are here. This week, no matter what you face, no matter what disappointment tries to come up, the first thing to do is to go to God in 
prayer and his word and just say, God, you're all I need. You're all I need. That relationship with Jesus is going to sustain you better than anything else. The next thing is to make the choice every day. Lord, I choose to be content. Even in the midst of my disappointment, I am choosing today that my circumstances do not dictate my contentment, that I am going to be content regardless of what's going on. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my need into a seed. What I'm asking others to do for me, I'm going to go and do. If I need encouragement, I'm going to sow encouragement. If I need someone to serve me, I'm going to sow serving other people. If I'm waiting on a breakthrough, I'm going to help someone else get a breakthrough. And the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to worship my way out of disappointment. I'm going to release thanksgiving out of my mouth. I'm going to release praise. I'm going to speak the name of Jesus. I'm going to declare that my God is working all things together for good. That my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Go ahead and just thank him this morning with worship, with praise. We love you, Jesus. You're faithful. You're good. Why don't you pray this with me all over this room? Just say, Jesus, I surrender. I'm all yours. I repent of sin. And I receive your forgiveness. Be my Lord and Savior. From this day forward, I'm following after you. You are my source. Help me, Holy Spirit, to choose every day to be content turn my needs into seeds to worship in the midst of disappointment my eyes are on you Jesus in Jesus name amen and amen I love you victory it's gonna be your best week ever